Is it possible to be a man or woman after God's own heart? In an example of it, but if it's possible, is it something we want? If we're honest, is it something we really want? This summer series is a powerful one because it talks about how God can take broken people like you and like me and do something wonderful in us and through us so that we follow God so closely we're known as someone after his own heart. Accomplished for us because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've got such a powerful message, you know. If we were to leave here today and go across the street to the parking lot, we'd begin to talk with people and we'd say, what are kind of the biggest needs in your life? Well, no, really, we want to know. I think they talk about the need for meaning and purpose the meaning for friendship. The people, if, if you ask them, they feel powerless and in over their heads, a little lost, not sure what to do with their regrets. And we have the joy and the opportunity to hold out the history contained in God's Word about how God takes people and makes them into something wonderful. We can tell people that it's possible that you can find freedom from your addiction that you can find peace in your financial life, that you can realize love and harmony in your family. We can tell people it's not easy. It's not automatic, but because of Jesus Christ, it's possible that they too can be a person for God's own heart. And as we study the life of David, we're not studying the life of a perfect man by any means. But we are studying the life of a man who's called a man for God's own heart. We continue our series this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And here we have a very interesting story. We are introduced to two people, a wealthy wealthy couple, a husband and wife. His name is Nabal. Her name is Abigail. Let's pick up the story in verse 3. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. I like this story already. This is going to be good. Now let's remember where we are in the life of David. David is king, but not yet king. Saul is king, but because of his disobedience, God has ended Saul's dynasty, and so David is now the king in waiting. And Saul's jealousy is such that he wants David dead. So David is on the run for his life. And he's gathered a band of followers around him. And he's trying to figure out what to do to stay alive. Verse 4. While David was in the desert during this wandering phase, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. Now, what we read in this chapter is that David found himself, David and his 600 men, took on the role of um, unofficial protectors of Nabal's 3,000 sheep. With David and his men around, they didn't have to worry about predators eating the sheep. They didn't have to worry about thieves eating the sheep. And David and his men didn't eat the sheep. And they were the protectors. And so we read that it is shearing time for Nabal. Now David didn't ask Nabal about doing this, but it seemed like this is a favor and so Nabal, so David sends messengers to Nabal during a time when he thinks he'd be in good spirits. Shearing time, payday. The smile on the farmer's face when the last crop's put in. The, the payday right before vacation. He's in good spirits. Maybe he's got a favor in him. So David sends messengers and says, um, you may know our master, King David, or soon to be King David. He's on uh, He's running for his life. Uh, and, or we've taken care of all your sheep. And he's saying, could you spare us some Spare us some provisions. Well, that sounds a little tacky, doesn't it? Well, I mean, yes and no. It was perfectly acceptable in the customs of the day for David and his messengers to be asking what is asking. And frankly, it was incumbent upon Nabal to, to meet this need at least part of the way. And here is, here is Nabal's response to David's servants. <laughs> Who is this David? <laughs> Who is this son of Jesse? Ah. Many servants these days are breaking away from their masters. Why should I take my bread, my water, and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to some men who are coming from who knows where? Hello. This is not good. 
Nabal says, nothing for your trouble, be on your way. And then even adding insult to injury, he just doesn't say no, he says, who's David? <laughs> he insults the future king, not a good move. He insults the father of the future king, who's Jesse? And he calls David <laughs> a runaway servant. Yikes! You know, it's not, it's not wise to burn bridges in life. After all, in today's polarized climate, it's easy to demand your way. But the Bible tells us that, and human experience confirms, if we even have to hand out some bad advice, try not to burn those bridges, because it can come back and hurt you. So now, all of a sudden, David is really upset. He is mad. Here he has done this favor, and he's on the run for his life. He's wondering what God has gotten him into. And now he's told no, and he's insulted. And his anger really flares. He is getting ready to make a huge and horrible mistake. We're about to see the possibility of a train wreck in slow motion. What's King Saul's problem? He has an enemy in David, and he wants to kill David. The king wants to take out personal vengeance. What's David faced with right now? The future king who has an enemy, and he's tempted to take out personal vengeance. And it's, we want to shout at the pages of Scripture, No, David, don't follow the way of Saul. Follow the way of God. Listen to, how, listen to how upset David is in verse 21. David had just said, It's been useless all my watching over this fellow's property in the desert so that nothing was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. And here he takes an oath. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave one male, I leave alive one male of all who belong to Nabal. David says, I'm taking an oath. I'm not just going to kill Nabal. I'm going to take out the entire male lineage of his family and wipe his name from the earth. Oh, my. Here is the future king who is so angry against a slight that he is willing to shed innocent blood with no thought that how it would damage the kingdom, no thought about how it would damage his kingship. This is not good. Meanwhile, one of Nabal's servants comes to Nabal's wife, Abigail. The servant had heard. He knew there was trouble brewing. My guess, this is not the first time that servant had had to go from Nabal to Abigail to explain what's going on. David's request, Nabal's foolish reply, and immediately Abigail knows that she has got to do something to fix this situation. So in a moment of courage, she sets out to make things right. Verse 18. Abigail lost no time. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep. Dressed for dinner, you might say. Five seas of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on their donkeys. So look, look verse 20. As she came riding down, as she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there was David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. David, hungry for blood. Abigail, desperate to save the situation. They meet each other on the crest of the hills, and there they move to the ravine. What is going to happen? The tense music plays. What's David going to do? How's he going to react? Is he going to start taking innocent blood here? What is going to happen to David, to Abigail, to Nabal, to the whole crew? Well, in, David's, in Abigail's meeting with David, she proves herself to be both bold and wise. She explains to David that her husband acted like a fool. And then she lets out the family secret that Nabal's name, when translated, means fool. His name's Nabal, he's a fool, he acted like a fool, we all know he's a fool, please don't take it out on his family. Please don't take it out on me. Please don't taint, she says, your future kingship. After all, hasn't God made great promises to you, David? Verse 28, she says, please forgive your servant Nabal's offense, 
For the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master, because he fights the Lord's battles. Let no wrongdoing be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my master will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. And David has an aha moment. In that moment, he realizes what a gift Abigail has done in in stopping him and persuading him from shedding innocent blood. Because of Abigail's actions, her wise and bold actions, she has prevented the future king from making rash, foolish, and life-smashing decisions. Abigail is truly a servant of the king and a servant of God. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that you've got somebody in your life is that when you're getting ready to make a life-smashing mistake, when you're getting ready to torch it all, they will pull you back from the brink. We all need people like that in our lives. I hope they're part of the faith community. I hope they're part of this church family. Look, don't go through life without somebody to be a guardrail for you. David had someone who saved him. Verse 32, David says to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been alive by daybreak. Verse 35, Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. Take a look at this painting. Abigail's moments of wisdom, courage, and leadership has captured the heart of artists throughout history, trying to record the works and acts of God. I googled David and Abigail doing research for the sermon, and there was painting after painting after painting about this moment. It, it fixed the, in the minds and the imagination of the artist of what God is doing here. Note, for example, the surprise of the soldiers. Note how Abigail's wise words are swaying the hot-tempered David, a moving and important story. This is a big deal what's going on here. But why? Why? Abigail returns home. Nabal is celebrating with a feast. Is no position to listen to reason or anything else. In the morning, she tells her husband what Nabal was planning to do. Nabal had no idea about David's murderous threats. He had no idea that Abigail went off to save the day. He knew nothing except he was just there counting his money. Verse 36, when Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things and his heart failed him and he became like a stone. Ten days later, Nabal was dead. Verse 39, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. David recognizes that vengeance is the Lord's, and the Lord took care of Nabal. But here is the twist in the story that I didn't see coming. End of verse 39. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to take you to become his wife. Abigail so impressed David that he asked for her hand in marriage. (laughs) This is quite a story, I told you. I am just imagining around the supper table. So mom and dad, how did you meet? Awkward silence. And then, well... And then there is this, well, son, uh, I met your dad when he was on his way to murder my first family and me, and uh, we kind of hit it off. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Lots of valuable lessons from this incredible story. We could talk about the dangers of angry and rash words, real danger. We could talk about the incalculable value of marrying a spouse with faith deeply entrenched in their identity and their practice. 
We could talk about the integrity of, talk about David's integrity in not taking advantage of another man's wife, a foreshadowing of a failure we're going to see in David in the future. But what's the point of having this story in the Bible? What are we trying to understand? And I think the point in this passage comes from the difference between Nabal and Abigail. Nabal got something wrong. Abigail got something right. Here's the difference. Abigail saw the king for who he was and followed him. Nabal, King Shmin, and didn't follow him, and he died. If we are going to be people who fashion our lives to live after God's own heart, here's the lesson that we need to take with us today. It's being a person after God's own heart begins by correctly recognizing and continually following the king. Being a person after God's own heart means correctly recognizing and continually following the king. Word had gotten out that David was the next king. Nabal didn't care. He was king of his own life. He wanted it that way, and he was willing to roll the dice to see what happened. Abigail saw the king, the servant of God, who would be used to bring about all the promises to the forefathers. And because she saw the king for who he was and submitted to him and followed him, she became wife of the king and shared in the joys of the kingdom. The Bible says that you and I have a king. His name is Jesus. We follow and serve King Jesus. And the story of Nabal and Abigail and David reminds us that we need to take stock of where we are in our relationship with King Jesus. Do we have him at arm's length Uh, Not right now, Jesus. i got more important things to do. Or do we kind of, "Ah, king, shming, I'm the king of my life. Or is maybe Jesus kind of a constitutional monarch in our life with a fancy title but no real power over how we react? You see, it's clear from this passage, and in fact from the entire Bible, that is no way to live and certainly no way to die. Now, you may be out here this morning and you have never taken that step to cross the line of faith, to bow the knee to King Jesus. But maybe today you're you're feeling it. You're hearing it. You know that, that you need to cross that line of faith. Don't let anything stop you today. Don't let anything stop you from expressing your faith, who Jesus Christ is, that confess that he is Lord of life and that you have sinned and to repent, to turn and walk a different direction than to have your sins washed away in the waters of baptism, to be baptized into Jesus Christ and to have the old you put to death, the new you raised to life, to be filled with the Holy Spirit and all your sins washed away. You can make that decision today. That is the path to life. That begins your journey of recognizing and following the King. But as Christians, we have a little more complicated relationship with King Jesus, don't we? We say he's our king, we've crossed the line of faith, but we resist following him too often. You see, we have a king who makes demands on our finances, our responsibilities to giving to the Lord's work. We have a king who's, who causes us to make, who makes demands on our entertainment choices, whether we fill our minds with wholesome stuff guard our minds from garbage. We, we serve a king who makes demands on our time. When it comes to talking about the hobby schedule and the league schedule and the investment of our energy, we resist. We know what we need to do, but we resist, and we have to find out why. Well, I suppose there's lots of reasons. Let me surface just one today. I think sometimes the reason we resist King Jesus is because we're afraid. We fear that if we follow King Jesus, things aren't going to work out for us. We fear that we might fall behind our friends on some 
important matter. We might fear that our kids' won't fe- kids future might not be as bright as it could have been. We fear our retirement might not be as enjoyable. And so we resist our king out of fear. But when you think about that, it makes no sense. We have a king who loves us. A king who has given his life for us. A king who sees all of history from beginning to end, from first to last. A king who knows us better than we know ourselves. It seems to me that we should not fear, but instead we should follow. One of my favorite spiritual writers, Bill Hull, said this, Nothing is so sad as someone being mediocre at something they love. Now, I love football. That doesn't mean I'm going to start for the Irish next season. I don't think that's what he's talking about. But what he's saying is, if we know what we need to do to follow our king, and we're settling for mediocre Christianity, he says that's just sad. I think we need to take stock I think we need to abandon those back of the envelope calculations we need, the back of the envelope calculations we make when we ask ourselves, I just, I'll be a Christian, but just barely. I want to go to heaven when I die, but I just want to do enough. I don't want to get crazy about this life of faith. My friends, I think the time has passed where when, when mediocre Christianity is, I think it needs to go. The world needs Christians who are bold in grace, bold in love, bold in faithfulness, bold in truth. People who correctly recognize and continually follow follow the king. After all, Christianity is true. God loves us. He's given us an example of his love in his son, Jesus Christ, to open the door for eternal life now and forever. My friends, let's not be mediocre. Let's go all out and follow our King.